reliability of all the components that we use in the space system is of the utmost importance, largely because you simply can't repair them. If a cryocooler needs its seals replacing once a year, which it does in a land-based uh, system, we can't do that in space because we can't send an astronaut up every year to change the seals. Similarly, items like valves have to be much more reliable. As a result, we inevitably end up spending far more on them, uh, largely because these items have to be qualified and tested to a much higher degree. People sometimes ask why it is that we have to do uh, cryogenics in space, because after all, isn't space very cold? Uh, the Earth has a shadow behind the Sun, and in this area you can radiate to deep space, and you might expect that to be very cold. This is perfectly true, provided you can keep your satellite in just the right location. In the case of a system like AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is a large superconducting mass spectrometer, the power requirements are such that it really has to be based on the International Space Station. Now, the space station circulates the Earth. Uh, it's therefore sometimes in the sun, sometimes in shadow. It also can't suffer from extremes of temperature because it has to have astronauts inside. Consequently, the average temperature on, on something that's orbiting in this manner is actually around room temperature. It's around 300 Kelvin. There have been cryogenic experiments which have been permanently in the Earth's shadow, but even there, they're, they're seeing radiation from other places, and the temperature they are is a heat balance between what they can radiate out to far space uh, and what heat is coming in. Uh, and in that case, a, a usual temperature is something like 135 Kelvin. And therefore, if you're going to use superconductors in space, you need to get the temperature considerably lower. And for this reason, we're using cryocoolers and bulk liquid helium. The type of cooling that we use really depends on what the application is. For a very large system like an infrared telescope or a large superconducting magnet, uh, it's probably difficult to avoid sending up liquid cryogens. Uh, for a smaller system like perhaps an adiabatic demagnetization refrigeration system, uh, you can get away with mechanical coolers. The lack of gravity makes dealing with cryogens in space very interesting. On the ground, a typical cryostat design is essentially a bucket and the liquid sits in the bucket. Usually, your magnet is on the end of a stick sitting in the, in the, uh, inside the helium. Now imagine you have no gravity. Where does the helium go? Well, it doesn't sit at the bottom. It tends to float away. Now, in zero gravity, you have two problems with this. One is you have no guarantee that the helium is actually anywhere near the magnet because it could float away. And the second is that also you can't guarantee iso that the helium is isothermal. In normal helium, if, if you get any heat input, uh, natural buoyancy takes over and the helium circulates and stays at the same temperature. In space, with no gravity, that isn't the case at all, and you could quite easily have a patch of helium over here which is considerably warmer than other parts of it, or thermal gradients that exist right across the Dewar. There's a way around both of these problems, and that's to use superfluid helium instead of normal liquid. Superfluid helium uh, is a, a different state of liquid that exists below a temperature of 2.17 Kelvin, when the helium essentially loses all its viscosity, uh, it gains a great deal of specific heat capacity, and its thermal conductivity increases by orders of magnitude. So you need a way of making sure that your magnet remains cold, even though there's no way of keeping the helium uh, near it. If that's achieved, then you can get stable operation. And this has been done four times on large superfluid helium satellites. The problem with cryogen-free magnets operating at high currents is the load it puts on the cryocooler. The heat load to a magnet of that type is dominated by what comes down the current leads, which connect room temperature power supply to the cold head of the cooler. This is actually proportional to the current. So if you can reduce the current by a factor of 10, you reduce the cryocooler power by a factor of 10 and reduce its cost uh, by a substantial amount as well.